Welcome back to another episode of the Talking Classical podcast. Today we'll be hearing from internationally acclaimed double bassist Leon Bosch. As many of you will be aware, the last few weeks have not been easy to process, not only with the COVID pandemic, but also the tragic murdering of George Floyd. In this conversation with Leon, I started off by asking him about his reaction to the recent news. And Leon talks of living, studying and working in apartheid South Africa and about his experiences within the classical music business. If you are affected by any of the issues in this podcast, I'll leave some links in the description box below to give you further advice, help and guidance. Many thanks to Leon for so generously taking the time to talk about his experiences. I mean, I, I'm not surprised by what happened, but what is different is the global reaction to it. You know, so it's hopeful, and also it comes at a particular time in our shared history as a human society, a time of difficulty, and people begin to see that it's not just a question of race. That is a far bigger question. What do you mean by the fact that the global reaction was was perhaps well, different? My personal reaction to seeing the murder in broad daylight of a man with a police officer in full view of bystanders who were trying to intervene, murdering a man. My first initial re and my first reaction, like anybody else's, was total revulsion, disgust, mm -hmm. outrage and sadness. And then my second thought was that actually this is not unusual. Why am I outraged? This has been happening for a very long time. And also the consequences for the perpetrators of this kind of injustice, zero. I mean, I cannot think of any successful prosecution in recent times of anybody that has murdered wantonly a black American, or indeed in the United Kingdom. It's not just like this happens in the United States, it happens here also. Then I realised that despite the public trying to intervene as George Floyd was being murdered, they were pre being prevented. And I think any normal human instinct is to prevent harm to fellow human beings or to oneself. The uh, protection of life is uppermost in everybody's instinctive reactions. But here, the public were being prevented from intervening in what was obviously a murder. I don't think we... Uh, the question of a trial, I mean, is immaterial. It was... I think everybody agrees worldwide that George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight, in full view of other human beings. And I thought to myself, how is it possible for them to have done that to a fellow American? Then I realised that it speaks volumes of the levels of indoctrination to which people like this have been subject for a very long time. It, uh, racism, of course, was invented as the justification for slavery and colonialism. Dehumanise people, which then makes it in order to do to them what you have done. We all know the colonial history, we also know the history of slavery. And it's not a very glorious part of human history, the depth to which we can descend. And the problem is that it is the system that requires racism. And it also, for the exploitation of human beings, you have to dehumanise them this way. And you probably know the American teacher, Jane Elliott, who did this little experiment in the United States about 50 years ago, separating the kids in the classroom with the blue-eyed ones and the brown-eyed ones and uh, giving the blue-eyed ones the impression one t at one time that they were superior to the others. And then you see the reaction. And then, of course, you turn the thing around. And that taught a very valuable lesson to young people. And as she rightly points out, nobody is born with a genetic disposition to racism and that it is taught. And anything that is taught, we can unlearn. So the reaction to George Floyd's murder was instant and global. I think every decent human being the world over felt the same revulsion and also realised that there's never been any justice in cases like this. We mustn't forget that it took a very long time for anybody to be arrested, even though it was a clear-cut case of murder. And the authorities were very slow to react. But throughout the world, people went out on the streets, despite the lockdown, to protest this grotesque murder. And it wasn't just black people protesting, it was everybody. There's been an awakening of sorts during this pandemic. 
people have begun to see the system for what it is. It brutalizes everybody. It exploits everybody in the interests of a small sector of our of the human society. I think everybody suggests that when one talks about the class struggle, that it is a fiction. But it is terribly clear that there's a, an elite, the super class, who control society in their interests at the expense of everybody else. And George Floyd is just another victim in this struggle. And I was pleased to see that everybody around the world decided to take action. It's only by collective action as human beings, you know, the question of solidarity. We talk about solidarity, but we seldom practice it because the system tries to separate us from each other. Look, during lockdown, everybody's been sitting in their own living rooms, watching television, doing whatever they do, but disconnected from every other human being. And that, of course, is problematic because as a species, we are fundamentally a social being. And it is our inter interaction with others that makes our own lives meaningful. But despite this isolation, everybody around the world decided that they needed to do something. And the reaction of the state has always been very vicious. I, mean, I don't know whether you noticed this, but it was interesting for me to realize that in the United States, for example, the United States government had been, at that point, incapable of providing medical equipment or protective equipment for their medical staff dealing with a pandemic. But within seconds of the protests going on the streets, they had at their disposal the most sophisticated machinery of oppression. Police vehicles, tear gas, rubber bullets, you name it. And this tells you something about the state. The state is far more interested in controlling the human population than preserving life. Much of the same happened in the United Kingdom, where the spontaneous protests were denounced, really quite viciously denounced. And it is always the same thing they try to do. They try to tarnish legitimate pro protest with the accusations of violence. But if you look at the historical record, we'll realize that the state inserts provocateurs into the crowds in order to foment the kind of violence which they can then use as a weapon to wipe away legitimate pro protest. But it hasn't worked. You will also know that in Britain, statues are being, uh, being torn down. And this, for me, is a, a useful indication that the population is no longer allowing itself to be controlled in the way that it thinks also. It begins to see the connection between the death of George Floyd and slavery and colonialism and all these statues around first world countries, the imperial countries, and the role that that played in the exploitation of, the, of other human beings across the planet. And they will no longer stand for this. There's this idea that tearing down a statue erases history, but of course this is bunkum. I think that in the United Kingdom, people learned more about British colonial history with the tearing down of the statue of Colston than they'd learned in the last hundred years. So I'm optimistic about the future. As somebody with a dark skin, a black person, I've never been immune from racism. It has always been deemed to be my problem because in the music business, as you know, it is fundamentally white. When I, as I grew up in South Africa, it was 99.9% .9 white. And in Britain, of course, it's not much different. It's maybe 98%, something in that order. I, I haven't got exact figures to hand, but so there's fundamentally, fundamentally no difference. But the other important thing that I learned very early on in life was that actually racism was exported around the world by the British. For example, the country in which I was born, South Africa, was a colony, a British colony. And the racism that continued in a formalized way in South Africa was set up by the British. And that, when I arrived in Britain, I was expecting something completely different, a society in which racism was not an issue. But I was soon disabused of that view. But just to return for a moment to George Floyd. George Floyd is just, again, one of many people that have been murdered by the state and without consequences for the perpetrators. You will probably know that one of the perpetrators uh, is free on bail of $750,000, apparently, according to the media. And one has to ask the question, who has paid three quarters of a million pounds of bail for this man? Is it right that somebody that is accused of such a heinous crime should be out on the streets? And then you have to ask that if he's out on the streets, you probably saw the video on YouTube of him being confronted in the supermarket. Then you have to ask, who is it that is funding this agenda to protect police officers who, on behalf of the state, perpetrate these crimes? This has always been the case, that uh, police officers are protected. They're the thugs of the state. The state has the, the monopoly on violence. Don't forget that if we withdraw our support for the system, it collapses. And the state, the only way it can coerce us into doing what it wants is through violence. Physical violence, economic violence, and social violence. And the violence, of course, comes in many forms. We have to understand what it is that they do to us. 
But I think that this period through which we're living, difficult period for everybody, has within it the seeds of a human revolution, an awakening and a better understanding. I know that there are signs to the contrary, where in Britain, for example, and in America, where we've had the worst outcomes with this virus, or uh, they are desperate to return us to work. Because the truth of the matter is that it is working people who create wealth. Being a central bank printing money does not create wealth. It is money that is worthless. And you will know that the central bank in America and also in Britain have been printing money like it's going out of fashion. But the consequences, I think, are all still to come. And I think, I mean, I, a few years ago, I was a little bit more pessimistic, thinking that the political level in Britain and other countries was so low. In fact, in Britain, I felt that the political level hadn't been as low for 100 years. But I alluded to the word earlier of solidarity, and I begin to see something like the solidarity arising in the British population, to know that we all face the same struggles, and that if we were divided on the basis of class, colour, and our particular jobs, we cannot be assured of any success or any progress. And it's only by working together that we can achieve something as a human society. The greatest advances in British society were made through collective action and militant action. We've all been taught that the word militant is a dirty word. But let's face it, if you were to protest along the lines that the state will let you, and if they decide the terms of reference for your protest, where you can go, what you can put, then of course it's neutralised already. So the conventional route has never been the route to achieving any success. Just think of the United Kingdom. The social, social security, the welfare state, universal education, music education for everybody, the National Health Service, pensions, work time directives. All these wonderful advances were not made on the basis of appealing to the better instincts of our ruling class. It was by taking up the cudgels and fighting for it. And if we don't maintain this level of vigilance, all these benefits will be taken away from us. You will probably, just to give you a little example, the retirement age in Britain is skyrocketing apparent in the basis that we cannot afford for people to retire with dignity after a lifetime of work. But as, you, as we now know, the printing presses can run without hindrance when necessary. Revulsion is a very strong, if as a human society, we don't allow this kind of action to happen and we assert our, a moral code that inflicting such violence on fellow human beings is unacceptable. We should stand up wherever we see it happen. This affects us all. It affects our prospects, our future. Racism is a scourge which infects the whole world. And it doesn't infect it, as I said earlier, it is taught to people. There's also, I mean, you probably know also that there's been a, some reaction from the right wing, the far right, you know, the loony fringes of the far right, talking about white lives matter. Now, this is completely and utterly irrelevant. But it is used as a means of separating us and also sowing division. You know, divide and rule is the perfect tactic. I often think to myself that the man that spits at me in the street and shouts abuse at me is not exactly terribly dangerous to my life's outcomes. It is the men in suits, wearing ties, who are on the, uh, the boards of our great companies, who sit on audition panels, who make decisions about the world, who make policy. They are the people that are really terribly dangerous. So racism is a uh, question of the institutions, which are uh, support it and create it and are, possible for in, are, are responsible for inflicting it on people. If we think of the Windrush scandal here, for example, it was the machinery of state that perpetrated this horrendous crime on people living in Britain, who were British citizens. The BBC had a uh, programme about one particular man who had been so badly affected by this, and I'm, it was horrifying to see what the state had done. We talk about the Soviet Union and the bureaucracy. I have never seen a bureaucratic system so dehumanize a human being on the basis of total fabrication and always moving the goalpost. Every time the man proved something they asked him to prove, it was not enough. And this is deliberate. You probably also know that the state, the British state, had deliberately destroyed all records of the arrival of that generation of young people and also their parents. And so it seems to me that that was a deliberate action in order to satisfy this bloodlust of the far right in terms of immigration. But it's useful for the state. When things are going badly economically, what happens? You have to blame somebody. We can go backwards in history. Who did Hitler blame for things not going well? And that look where that ended up, with concentration camps and the extermination of six million people, minimum. If we think of the slave trade, 
The numbers have not even been properly collated because it's so horrific. Our history also has failed to teach us that there are people amongst us in our society who still benefit from the proceeds of slavery. You probably saw recently that academic researchers have found or they've brought to, uh, into public the public domain information about compensation to slave owners for the loss of their slaves. And the money that was paid to these slave owners amounted to something like 40% of the, nat uh, the national budget. And that debt apparently was only paid off in 2015. So the idea that you and I and every other British citizen or subject, whatever you would like to call them, has been paying money for slave owners. And the slaves, of course, got nothing. This is an affront to everybody. We should not allow these things to happen. But the British state has always been in the habit of hiding its history, obscuring things. Just in the last couple of years or so, academics have made a calculation using very, very useful data and also met methodology, but working out that the British state, in, in effect, has stolen the equivalent of about £46 trillion from India, another colony. So I think revisiting our history is vitally important because without understanding the past and the present, we cannot go into the future. We have to have a realistic understanding of what it is that will pro propel us into the future. Also our place in the world. With Brexit happening around us, everybody is been whipped up with this kind of false sense of nationhood, nationalism. Nationalism is hatred of others. There's nothing wrong with patriotism, love of your country. Of course, you know, uh, one has an affection for the place in which one was born and where you've spent your life and your experiences. Nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to hating others, as nationalism tries to encourage, you know, uh, it's a problem. And also, as you will know, that nationalism is based on myths, mythology. I mean, it's uh, based on the idea that we're better than them. And therefore, it's fine to go to war with them. How did they manage to go to war with Iraq? It was to dehumanize the Iraqis and Saddam Hussein, the man who represented the Iraqi state as the head of government. With Libya, the same was done. Dehumanize uh, Muammar Gaddafi and then murder him in the streets. Is this a way to conduct international relations, murdering heads of state in the street? I think not. So the West and imperial powers, far from observing the rule of law, live by the law of the jungle. Might is right and resort to violence first. And that ties very neatly with the George Floyd question. Violence is used against the human population in order to achieve certain outcomes. So we have a very big task on our hands, not just in music, but as a human society. We have to create the sort of society we think we deserve. And unless we're all actively engaged in creating a better society, then we're also responsible for its crimes. South Africa. To most people, it seems like distant history. But here I am, I'm a 58-year-old man, and I lived through an incredibly crazy time in South Africa, some of the most brutal years of apartheid. South Africa was the most openly racist society on the planet during that period. Not only that, this racism was enshrined in law. And not only that, it had support from most major countries in the world, the United States, the United Kingdom. Margaret Thatcher, for example used the veto in the United Nations 13 times, I think it was, to prevent any action against South Africa. Now, what did, what did apartheid mean? It meant that there was brutal segregation of the races. So if, if you were white, you occupied over 80% of the country. And if you were black, you were herded into the most grotty parts of the country, into the townships and homelands. Now, what's a township? A township is a ghetto with economic prospects zero, with infrastructure zero, unemployment sky high. One of the most degrading things to have to put up with is life in a ghetto. It doesn't, it's not just a question of the physical problems, it's also what it does to your mind and what is, it did to the minds of everybody who lived in the townships. What did apartheid mean? It meant that I couldn't go to the beach. It was illegal to go to the beach because the beaches were for whites only. I couldn't go for a walk up Table Mountain, which was, you know, the iconic mountain which defines Cape Town. I had never been up the Table Mountain because it was illegal. There was a cable car that used to take people on a funicular, and I had never been on a cable car because it was for whites only. Restaurants. I had never had the experience of going to a restaurant because it was illegal to go to restaurants. The only thing I could do in a restaurant was to go to work in the kitchen or wash the dishes or as a waiter. Schools were segregated. 
white South Africans had their wonderful schools, well funded, with great facilities and everything anybody could possibly want, at a standard which exceeded often the standards in the rest of the first world. If I, if I had to cross a road with a bridge or a railway line, there were two bridges. One was for whites only, and the rest was for dark people like me. If you wanted to sit on a bench when you were tired, you had to be very careful. You had to choose the bench which didn't say whites only because you'd be beaten to within an inch of your life by the police. The trains were segregated. On most trains in the suburbs where I used to have to travel to university, if you had ten carriages for the train, eight would be whites only, and you'd have two into which the majority of the population had to be crammed. And it was awful, because people would be hanging from the trains, wanting to desperately to get to work, and they were stuffed over capacity. People would sometimes be on the roof of the train because they didn't want to be late for work. It was horrendous. It was dehumanising. So that is the atmosphere in which I grew up. You also knew that your life mattered for nothing. You were not welcome anywhere. You couldn't do anything. To go to university, you had to have a permit. So when I wanted to go to university, I applied for a permit for law, and it was refused. And then I applied for a permit for music, and I got one. So I went to study music. So I had to travel every day from the townships into the white suburbs of South Africa, which may as well have been a different planet. It was... I mean, they were fabulous facilities. But the other thing which is interesting was that I travelled by train. I had to get up very early in the morning and catch two trains. And also I had to cross a bridge and I had to make sure to go over the non-white bridge. And when I got to the train station nearest the university, there were two stations I used often. There was Rosebank and Rondebosch. The university had buses which would transport students from the train station to the campus. But those buses were for whites only. So I had to walk, like the rest of the dark students. We had to walk, but white students got to these buses. The residences at university were white only. So fellow students, dark students like me, however far away they lived, they couldn't live in the residences, they had to just travel by train. I mean, there were some friends of mine who used to travel something like 40 miles each way every day to come to university. And then, as my career progressed in music, I also realised that the staff at the university were also racist. You weren't welcome as a human being. They were always trying to disadvantage you, undercut you. For example, ir irrespective of how good you were, you would never be chosen to play in concerts, exchange concerts with other universities. When it came to opportunities for scholarships, usually it would go to white South Africans who were already wealthy. And it was horrible. I mean, I, one of my lecturers cheated me. Every year she would mark me down and one final year I was able to prove it and she was eventually fired from the university but the fact that you, I was up against these people made it a real struggle and you, I also learned then that if you had a black skin in this society you had to work twice as hard as anybody else to achieve minor victories I began to play with the Cape Town Orchestra as a student but only because my bass teacher was Hungarian and racism to him was anathema. And he insisted that it was part of my education and that basis I was allowed to get into the city hall, which was, you know, whites only. My parents never heard me perform whilst I lived in South Africa because they could never go to the constables because of segregation, racial segregation, which was legal. My father died having never heard me play professionally. He never came to a concert with the Academy of St. Martin Fields. As you know, I was principal base of the Academy of St. Martin Fields. He never heard the Academy because he wasn't allowed to travel. Because he was a staunch opponent of the apartheid system. And he'd been detained, uh, imprisoned, and also banned many times. Now, just to explain what banning means, is house arrest. For five years at a time, he'd be put under house arrest, which meant that he could not leave the house till 7 o'clock in the morning to go to work, but he'd have to be back in the house by 5.30. And weekends, he was confined to the house. We were allowed no visitors. Even his parents couldn't come into our house. They had, When they visited, they had to be outside the gate. And 
this happened repeatedly to him for periods of five years. He was under banning orders. But I prospered as a musician in South Africa because I worked very hard. I practiced most days up to eight hours. I'd get on the township trains, go to the beautiful suburbs of Rondebosch and Rosebank, go to university. And I was the only base, first study base student, so I had the room to myself. I used it for, it was like my home. I practiced up to eight hours every day. There was a good library and I made very good use of it. There was a listening la laboratory which had records more than you could possibly listen to in a lifetime and I listened to so much. I also had people who helped me in the library. For example, I was terribly poor. Buying music was not an option, but I wanted the music to be able to learn it and to have my copy of the music into which I could put my specific markings. So I developed a relationship with some of the staff of the university who were black, that they would copy music for me and they would bind it with covers to make it a little bit more durable and they would sew these photocopies into beautiful covers and I still have the music here in my house from the late 1970s and the uh, uh, 1981. Copies made for me lovingly by the staff at the University of Cape Town. There were one or two other people who were very much on my side in Cape Town and helped and they were all foreign. Alan Stevenson, the composer, British-born composer, who conducted the university orchestra, and he has written music for me. He was instrumental in my musical development. And then the person that was the key to me coming to the United Kingdom was Sir John Manuel. And I don't know whether you remember him. He was head of the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. He had also been the director of the Cheltenham Festival, and a very influential man in the music business in Britain. But he was external examiner for my final recital in South Africa. And he mentioned the idea that I should consider coming to England. And of course I did end up in Manchester at the Royal Northern College of Music. But my, the South African episode was a brutal one. And I think it'd be too easy to forget that this is what was inflicted on generations of people. We are now invited to believe that everything has changed and society has moved on. But I have to point out that like in the United States and in Britain, the institutional problem remains. Nothing has fundamentally changed. The townships still exist in South Africa. It is black people who are still the poorest, who have the worst jobs, the worst health outcomes. The economy is still in the same hands. It is the same superclass who own everything in South Africa. Land. There's been no meaningful redistribution of land. And of course, land is at the root of wealth. When you have collateral, you can borrow money. You can do things when you own things. Black South Africa owns precious little. There's a small little middle class that have been bought off to continue the work of uh, what was the apartheid regime the British before them. What, Harry Be Belafonte, what did Harry Belafonte call uh, Barack Obama when he became president? He said he was the kitchen slave. And what he means really is that the system requires people of colour to be able to legitimise the system and also to carry, continue to carry out their work seemingly as if they are doing something for people that are darker. For people of colour, you have the challenge that you have to work to be accepted by the system. You cannot just be on your own terms because it's not good enough for the system. You will know that whenever situations arise, they always try to find someone with a dark skin who will speak up for the view of white South Africa or white Britain or whatever it is. The kitchen slaves. In India also you had this kind of problem where there was a class of Indians who inflicted the brutality of British colonial rule on, fellow, on their fellow human beings in India, but they got benefits out of it. They, and this is where class and colour have an interesting relationship. But be that as it may, I left South Africa because I realised that I could never have the kind of career or life that I would like to have in South Africa. How could I possibly have a job as an orchestral musician? How could I possibly do all the things that my fellow white South Africans took for granted? To go to a restaurant, to go up the mountain, to drive freely anywhere, to walk on the beach. Simple pleasures I was denied. And it's interesting actually because when I did return to South Africa for the first time in 1995, I took my young children with me. And they of course are British born, they would grown up. And I showed them all these wonderful things, the mountains and the beaches and the restaurants and all the beautiful things. And my eldest boy who was just a few years old and said, Daddy, this is quite beautiful. Did you do all this when you were a child? And I had to say no. And then I realized the reason I had never done any of that was because it had been illegal. Now we have to remember that and realize what it is that, what the job is that we have to done, uh, that needs to be done. So out of South Africa, my education was quite marvelous because I was able to utilize the help of some individuals of principle. I can name quite a few of them, but I remember them. I will remember them forever.
Zoltan Kovacs, my double bass teacher, Alan Stevenson, the composer, Noel Travers, who taught me in youth orchestras, Edna Elphick, my first, my cello teacher at university. And I also remember the monsters. But in any case, I escaped South Africa. I made a friend of a travel agent who got me a passport and made it possible to step on a plane. And I arrived in the United Kingdom on the 4th of January, 1982. All I had was a new raincoat, a suitcase, and a dream. And I decided that I wanted to make it work. You know, the, you know, the very first thing I did when I, I arrived on, a, I think it was a Sunday morning, and the very first thing I did was I went to the South Bank to a concert. And there I had high hopes. I was going to hear music in the first world. I'd come from a backwater, the third world. And you know, what struck me was that the orchestra that I went to hear, the complexion was exactly the same as it had been in Cape Town on the Thursday evening in the City Hall with the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra, totally white. But I thought nothing of it. I thought, well, I'll go to a few more concerts to find out a little bit more. So I went to the opera. I went to the English National Opera to hear the Marriage of Figaro, or to see and hear the Marriage of Figaro. And I peered into the pit, and it was the same thing. Then I began to realise that I had not left this problem behind, that this problem existed in the United Kingdom also. But be that as it may, my mission was to learn to play the double bass as well as I possibly could. And that was the thing that I really wanted to do. The idea of an orchestral career had not occurred to me. That wasn't what I came to Britain to do. I came to learn the bass and to broaden horizons. So whilst I was at Music College in Manchester, again, there were a few people who championed my cause. And I was very lucky to have such powerful people in my corner. Sir John Manuel was one of them. I met Sir Charles Groves, the great British conductor. He loved what I did as a kid and he helped me throughout my life and I was present at the very last rehearsal that he ever conducted with the Manchester Camerata where I was principal double bass. Timothy Rennish, who's still alive, in his 80s now, he arranged concerts for me to play because he thought what I did was worth hearing for the public. I was very fortunate uh, and it was recommended to me then that I should start auditioning to do extra work with orchestras. So the very first thing I did was I auditioned to get on the extra list of the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. And my audition was at lunchtime, during the lunch break for the orchestra. And I was going to be listened to by the principal double bass and one or two other people, and I played the audition. And actually, at that point in my life, I had no fear. I knew that I could play the bass. And sure enough, I was put on the extra list. And years later, I discovered, I learned that there had been rumours going around about this young black bass player that did amazing stuff. And when I played my audition, apparently the rest of the section were high, crouching behind the timps to hear this kid playing. But in any case, I did start working with the orchestra as a freelancer. But shortly after that audition, I went to a social function, a party at the home of a violinist. And at that party, I was attacked and racially abused by a white member of the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. He tried to drown me in a bath of water. He had run the bath to the top and he tried to drown me in the bath. And whilst he was trying to hold me under, he was shouting racial abuse at me. And I struggled, of course, to get out of the water and not many people seemed in that instant to be intervening to help me. But the host of the party came in, she heard the commotion, she came in, she realised what was going on and she threw him out. But for me, that was a really serious wake-up call. I realised that I was in as, in as much danger as a person of colour in the United Kingdom as I had been in South Africa. And that's a shocking example of the kind of thing that I've experienced since 1982. It's been ongoing. It's never better or worse. Twenty years later, I was subjected to something equally horrifying. And I have to tell you that this was the first time that I ever chose to go to the police about it or to try to make a complaint. And the reason I tried to go to the police about it was because I had been abused by a policeman, racially abused by a policeman. Uh, this was 2004. And the story is very simple. I had been invited to participate in the Swaledale Festival, which, as you know, is in Yorkshire. And it's a long drive. It was a long drive from where I was at that time. I was driving from my home in Tring. I set up really early and I arrived in time to have my lunch looking out over a beautiful scene in the valley. And then I decided I needed to go to check in at the guest house where I, which I had been assigned to. And driving down the little lane towards that guest house, suddenly a jeep came speeding up behind me. 
And I thought, good, this must be maybe they're the owners. And I stopped the car and I got out and two people in the car, two men in the Jeep, and they leapt out and started shrieking at me, overtly racist language. And they threatened me. We've been watching you. We know your kind. You hear to whatever it was they accused me of, and I then said, Look, I think you've got the wrong end of the stick. I, I'm here to participate in the festival, and I'm just about to go and check into the guest house. And they wouldn't take that as read. They forced me to provide documentary proof that I was in the, participating in the festival and that I, was, that I had a reservation in the guest house. So I got out emails, and I said, here we are. And even though they'd been proven completely wrong in what they had done, they didn't apologize, and they left and they said, and whilst you're here, we'll be keeping an eye on you. And I was shaken, and I went into the guest house, and I related this tale to the lady that owns the guest house. And, and she... Now, what I omitted to tell you was that these two men were in plain clothes. And she then told me that actually they were serving police officers, that they were stationed in this town and that they were police officers. And, I, and that shook me even further. So I, that afternoon, before going to rehearsal, I decided to speak to the directors of the festival. And I asked them whether they would, they would take this case up on my behalf with the police and the authorities. And I told them that I would felt that I wanted to leave, that I was no longer really willing to participate in the festival, that I was so badly shaken by this. But they persuaded me to stay. And I'm sorry to have to tell you that they did not intervene with the police. They did not make any representations at all. So after my participation in the festival, I decided to try to make a complaint. So I rang the divisional headquarters in Richmond of the police. And I told them that I wanted to make a complaint of harassment and racist abuse. And then things became even worse. The officer who took my telephone call told me that, sorry, I'm not going to log this because we don't have problems with ethnic minorities up here. He refused to, take, to, make a com uh, to register my complaint or to deal with it. So I wrote a letter to the superintendent of the North Yorkshire Police. And I heard nothing for about a week or two. But then I received a phone telephone call. And that telephone call was from the chief's, chief superintendent himself. He said that my letter had passed his eyes, it had crossed his desk, and that he was horrified. Was I at home the next day because he wanted to drive to my home in Tring to come and apologise in person on behalf of the police force? And he further advised me that maybe a prosecution was not the best way forward, but he recommended something called local resolution, where he would personally speak to the officers involved, require them both to write a written apology to me, and also that they should both be subjected to what he called diversity training. And because he was such a decent man himself and taking the trouble to come all the way to see me, I decided not to proceed with the prosecution, but accepted that. I accepted the local resolution route. I have his letter on record here, and before we spoke, I got the letter out of my filing cabinet. And the constables who abused me are named in this letter. And actually, reading it now makes me feel very uneasy. And it reminds me that, as a black person in the United Kingdom, my relationship with the police is not an easy one. In between these two incidents of the drowning and the police abuse, there have been many others, little ones and sometimes bigger ones. I've always been stopped by the police for no good reason. And you must know that in the United Kingdom, you begin to expect that. You know, stop and search. I've never been stopped and searched and physically frisked, but I've been stopped in my car, driving home from concerts, driving to concerts. Also, it is not just the police that practice this level of interference in one's life in the United Kingdom. It is also one's fellow musicians. You know, if I could remember the number of times I've been told to go back where you come from, I'd, you know, I could make a lot of money by putting a pound in a jar every time somebody told me that. And one would think that musician colleagues are slightly better than that, but actually my experience tells me something else. I mean, I remember when I turned up to one of my first in professional engagements, I went to work with the Scottish Ballet Orchestra. And to greet me, one of the musicians came running up to give me a high five, and he was 
imitating some sort of English patois. And this was his idea of what I am as a human being. Of course, I stepped aside and looked at him quizzically. And I've, well, anyway, that little encounter disintegrated. Now, how does this play out in life for everybody? Of course, it has consequences. When I left the academy in 2014, one of my colleagues apparently said to somebody else, what an amazing career Leon has had especially when you consider that he's black. So if one's colleagues believe that it's unusual for you to have a su successful career in Britain if you're black, then it says something. It means that it's absolutely true. But I know this, that it is true. I didn't require him necessarily to validate that thought, but I'm, I am grateful for, to him for having expressed that view, because this is how it is. The other little thing I would like to add into this, because it's quite illuminating. When I was beginning to audition for jobs, in the 1980s, mid-1980s, my double bass teacher then prepared me for one of these auditions. And, of course, you probably know that I use the German bow. I play German bow. And also, I prefer to stand when I'm playing. And his advice to me for, before I went to this particular audition was, I think you should sit down when you play, because it's bad enough already that you're black and also you play the German bow. And actually, this was just the truth. But fortunate for me, that audition was for the... Estonian conductor Nim Yarvi, who of course does not have, did not have, and does not have this kind of racism as a part of his being. He loved what I did, and he offered me a job in the Scottish National Orchestra. And I have great admiration for what he's done as a musician. I love him dearly as a human being, also. And it's people like that that have been meaningful in my life. Also, Walter Veller was a composer, like uh, a conductor like that. He embraced me, and as a human being, I felt touched by the fact that he felt able to reach out to me. I met him when I was an extra player in the Liverpool Philharmonic. But, you know, I was also referred to by the staff, teaching staff at the Royal Northern College of Music, as that little boy from the colonies. This is demeaning language, and of course it tells you a lot about the kind of relationship you're going to have with people. I will never forget that, the little boy from the colonies, an affront. Now, has there been progress in music in the United Kingdom? Do you know, as I said, when I arrived in the United Kingdom in 1982, I felt that I thought that I'd left racism behind. And here we are, 38 years later, and I'm sorry to have to tell you that absolutely nothing has changed. Nothing. There have been conferences, there have been policies, diversity, discussions, millions have been spent and a lot of hot air expended. Look, the establishment in classical music is only going to engage with diversity if it suits the bottom line and if it suits their personal agenda. They'll exploit anybody in order to make money and to look as if they're politically correct. Now, I turn the word politically correct back on the system because they often, you know, there's often the accusation that if as a person of colour you've had success or you've been invited to do something, it's only because you have a dark skin, that there's no merit involved. There have been conferences throughout the 1980s, the 90s, the early 2000s about diversity. And it has been my experience that every time these discussions take place, it is not my opinion they seek, but they want to tell me what it is I should be thinking and what I should be doing. What should be... I mean, I, look, there's the Chinook Orchestra, which oh, you okay. mentioned, and Chi Chi has done a marvellous job to create something like that. But I feel profoundly sad that it was necessary for her to have to do that. That alone speaks volumes about what it is that's going on in music in Britain. It is not as if they aren't great musicians of colour. There are obstacles and barriers to them being able to be employed in the profession. Audition panels don't always listen with their ears. They listen with their eyes. Orchestras also now are drawn largely from what I call the cappuccino classes, the middle classes. For example, the National Youth Orchestra is mostly kids from private schools. It is the preserve of the rich going to specialist music school. Going to junior academy or junior college or any of the junior things is expensive and there's no way that every kid is going to be able to participate and my view is that we should return to what we had at the end of the second world war when jenny lee the minister for the arts had this wonderful policy of free access irrespective of your parents means financial means that policy was so empowering and so enlightened it gave us a generation of great musicians british orchestras after the second world war were world beating Lots of wonderful institutions came into being. The Academy of St. Martin in the Fields was born after the Second World War. 
it became a global brand for excellence in music. Yeah, it was like a worldwide sensation. Absolutely. It? And this came out of this new enlightened policy. Don't forget that Sir Neville Mariner was just a little man from Lincoln. He wasn't from the privileged strata of society. He had not gone to Eton or Oxford. He was just a great musician with a vision, a man with a vision. And it was possible for him to implement that vision because the environment was a favourable one. String quartets flourished. Think of all the wonderful string quartets that were born and that had great careers because they were funded to do what they did. It's not just a question of colour and disadvantage in colour in music in Britain. It's also a question of class. And I have to tell you a little small story about my experience of the worst aspect of that class question in music. One of the first things, my first teaching jobs, was to teach the basis of the youth orchestra in Knowsley, Liverpool. Knowsley is one of the most deprived boroughs in the country. But they had an enlightened man who ran the music services and he'd set up this orchestra, the Knowsley Youth Orchestra, and they employed specialist staff to teach kids who would otherwise never access music. And one of the students that turned up was a young man enthusiastic about music and the double bass. He'd never had a lesson in his life. But within 18 months of me teaching him, he'd passed grade 8 with distinction and been offered an unconditional place to study the Royal Northern College of Music. But he was a working class kid from the council estates of Liverpool. And when he came to the college in Manchester, his face and accent just did not fit. His life was made miserable. And he left the Royal Northern after one year where they'd actually failed him in his practical exam, despite the fact that I knew that he could play incredibly well. He then went to Birmingham Conservatoire, where to begin with he flourished, because he had a teacher who didn't care for class or for problems like that. And he taught him on the basis that he was a fellow human being and a musician with a dream. But unfortunately for this student, that teacher left the conservatoire and he changed teachers to somebody else. And this person had these class sensitivities. And the student then began to suffer, and he failed his third year exam, practical exam, and he came to me for lessons during the summer because he'd been offered a retake. He did the retake, played extraordinarily well, and continued. But he eventually went down the route of musicology, and he's a phenomenal musicologist, forensic musicologist. He has a better understanding of manuscripts than anybody that I know in the world. He can tell you the difference between the paper from one year to the next and the pen and the thought process of the composers. Really extraordinary man. But do you know what he does for a living? He works as a care worker because he's never been able to find a route into the music profession because there are barriers to people like him. And I feel profoundly sad about that. But one day when I drove him, he came to visit me. I drove him to the station. This is over 20 years ago. He said that he wanted to thank me, and I thought he was thanking me for dinner that evening. And he said, no, I want to thank you for changing my life. If it hadn't been for you, this whole world would have been off limits to me. I would never have benefited from this incredible thing called music. Which leads me neatly to our, my role in the world as an educator and as a musician. I'm often invited to be on panels for auditions, for competitions and for scholarships and various other things. And it's my responsibility to know that I should choose on the basis of merit, not of, with class sensitivities, but also to understand potential, human potential. When I listen to somebody that's had a fantastic education, I know that they've had a fantastic education. When I listen to somebody that's incredibly motivated but has not had a great education but has great potential, I should, it should be my responsibility to be able to identify that. Also, I'm not going to practice censorship in the music business to try to create just a little bubble of wealthy middle-class people because music is far bigger than all that. Music is the expression of human life in sound and everybody has the fundamental right to participate in that. I know from my own experience of life that most of the orcs I've travelled the world with and most places I've been, it has always been a very narrow sliver of society that has benefited from the music that I have performed. Also, my relationship with the people to whom I play, I have had to examine through my life. Something that I found horrifying, actually, was once I left the academy. I began to go to the other side of the divide and I, used, I started going to more concerts than I had done for 20 years. And I'd sit front of house in concert halls, listen to conversation and listen to just people watching. And somehow, and this is a very controversial thing to say, but I came away with a deep sense of unease because I realised that the audience to whom I had been playing 
or most of the audience whom I'd been playing, didn't care a jot for music. They might as well have been going to the, the races or to a good party to something else. They were there to be seen, to be heard, and they wanted to speak more loud than anybody else because they want everybody to hear how important they are. This was a question of status anxiety. And I find that quite troubling. Of course, it doesn't mean that there aren't people who go to, to concerts because they love music. Oh, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, of course, there are people. <laughs> yes. So I, I just want to make that clear, that I don't think... Of course, of course, goes. of course. But overwhelmingly, there's a question of status anxiety and signalling. And what I find interesting also is that you will know this phenomenon, that it's possible to go to a concert, let's say of a wonderful youth orchestra, United Kingdom Youth Orchestra, people with fab- that have had a fabulous education, they dressed up to the nines... Young people, you know, wearing stuff that you imagine you should only afford after a couple of decades' worth of work, made with makeup, all the kind of trimmings of affluence. But they will play, and they will play all the right notes in the right order. And you will leave and go home and feel emotionally empty. And there have been occasions when I've gone to hear youth orchestras from other parts of the world. Kids from the favelas in South America, kids from the townships in South Africa. And Almost without exception, when these kids finish playing, the audience are dancing in the aisles. And I keep asking myself, what is it that those kids with a poor education have discovered in music that seems so inaccessible to affluent Western society? And I don't mean that nobody in Western society understands music or uh, can access the deeper emotions and things. And I'm troubled by that. And my feeling is this, that once we've lost the social connection with our art form, we're in trouble. It is not just a purely academic pursuit or one of status. And you must, I don't know whether you've been keeping an eye on the music business during this terrible lockdown time. Who's speaking up for the music business? It is celebrities. All the maestros of the major orchestras were silent for three months until they were cajoled into writing letters and appearing on radio. They felt no compunction about leaving their musicians to starve or not intervening on their behalf, with all the power that they apparently have. Meetings with secretaries of state, with politicians, it's been very poor. The music business is not very well represented. And I think also something that I've identified as a problem, not just now, but always, has been that the bureaucracy deliberately infantilizes musicians. It will not allow them at the top table. It will not allow them to contribute to the debate. It won't allow them to engage in the business of music. They are servants who will play the music, turn up and be paid a pittance and they go home. If you look at the data, financial data for music, then you realise that a musician's share of turnover is minuscule. The average musician in the United Kingdom earns £6,000 a year less than the national average income. And on the basis of a lifetime of practice, I think that's a poor return. If by contrast you look at music agencies or instrument dealers or, you know, concert halls or whatever, you know, you look at what they make out of music, it's quite wonderful. If you look at the streaming platforms, who have no content of their own, but they use the intellectual property of the artists. Spotify apparently had a turnover of something close to 7 billion in 2019. And as an artist, what have I received from Spotify? Nothing. And so, of course, we have a a broken system that needs to be fixed. How do we fix this system? It's not just the question of diversity, participation, and things like this have to be fixed. It is the very nuts and bolts of the whole system that need upending and reconstructing. If music truly is the expression of human life in sound, then it should be available and accessible to everybody for free. Free education. What can be wrong with free education? And I always believed in this fundamental thing, that there should be free health care and free education for everybody not just in Britain, but everywhere in the world, because we can only prosper as a human society when we are healthy and well-educated. And if you return to where we started with George Floyd in the United States, we have millions of people around the world, billions, that are disadvantaged deliberately in order that a small sliver of the superclass can benefit financially. They, they do prosper at our expense. So you and I and every musician has an incredible task. How do we change what is happening around us? I have a student where I teach at Trinity Laban Conservatoire who is black. He only came to study with me in September, last September. He had already completed undergraduate studies and he was trying to make his way in the musical world with precious little success. 
And it was clear to me that as soon as I heard him play that actually he was not just a very gifted musician, but he had world-class potential. And the only reason he wasn't prospering was because of his colour. And I began to teach him, and part of my teaching is not just a question of instrumental command, but it's also a conceptual framework for dealing with the music profession as a whole and also with the world as, as it is. Not the world as you think it should be, but as it really is. And I also began to identify the things that he should be trying to do. And within a short space of time, he began to be offered trials for principal positions. Principal positions, when previously he was deemed not good enough to fulfill a role as a rank-and-file musician. And part of the reason, in addition to the framework that he has, is that he now believes in himself. He knows what it is he has to do to fight this huge system. But also, I am willing to turn up to competitions to sit in the back of the room when my students play, just so that everybody in the panel knows that this kid's not alone, that they have support, a system in place, somebody who knows what happened on the day. And you know, also when I do my, when I, I'm often jury of competitions, and it's interesting to me that the outcome on the, for uh, in competitions where I'm chairman of the jury, we often have very different results to juries that do not have the presence of somebody of colour on the panel. You must know that in music, there are a lot of these racist ideas which go around. For example, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Eastern musicians have no idea about the emotion of the music, but they can play all the notes in the right order. That is completely and utterly racist. And I have often had to say this to colleagues when they utter these beliefs. With black musicians, oh, it's not in their culture. This, again, is utterly racist and has to be confronted everywhere it tries to rear its ugly head. Women also suffer to an extent in music. One of my students, who is now absolutely flying, had a very difficult time, and her difficulties were based entirely in her gender. She was a woman in a man's world. I was present in a conversation where some professional colleagues who had encountered her in the music business were disparaging her, and I stood up for her. I confronted them. And you have to be brave to confront these issues, and that's my responsibility to do. And I will always fight. As a young 15-year-old in South Africa, as you know, I was prepared to stand up to fight for justice, for democracy, things which were illegal in South Africa. I was prepared to sacrifice my life in the pursuit of those principles. And likewise, in fighting the cause of music, I will stand up for anybody facing disadvantage or that needs advocacy. If I had the responsibility, you know, I have very few students because I don't have that an enormous amount of time. I have half a dozen at Trinity and I do various master classes and various other things around the world, but actually it's not a full-time occupation for me. But I know that everywhere I've been in the world, I've been able to make an impact in the lives of people just by being principled. When I coach the double basses of the iCulture Orchestra, I allow them to believe in themselves, that they could go anywhere in the world, despite the fact that some of them felt that they were from poor Eastern European countries. They had this kind of neurosis of poverty. And I understand the neurosis of poverty. I grew up in a township. I didn't possess a bass or a bow until I was in my 20s. This is insane, but that was the reality for me. I know what it's like to be made to feel poor and how your nose is rubbed in it. And I know that I can help anybody who suffers those same neuroses which are ongoing in Western society, and in fact, global society. It is for me quite heartwarming. Every now and again I get a message out of the blue from somebody that I encountered at a music festival a decade ago, or even longer, and they will say, Dear Mr. Bosch, I just thought I'd write to let you know that this is what I'm doing. And usually it's something usually successful. And they will always say, and I date the change in my fortunes to that moment when we, when you spoke to me on the steps of such and such a concert hall or whatever. And it makes me realise how powerful one's words are. Whatever you say to anybody can stay with them for life. And if they're disparaging words, it will undermine them forever. If they're encouraging, you can change their outcomes. So we have to be very careful. I know that the words that were uttered to me in my upbringing by the apartheid regime were dehumanising ones. And I know that I'm still struggling with that burden. You cannot just make it go away. So it's important that this question, which rears its head every now and again, the question of diversity in music and things, we have to examine carefully and realise what it is that needs to be done. The entire art establishment has been a friend to the neoliberal politics of the last 40 years. They never confronted that 
model of politics. They try to dance with the devil, and as you know, it always leads to disaster. The art council budget has been cut inexorably since 1979 by huge amounts. The coalition government cut it by even bigger amounts, and it's continuing. And it's obvious to me, at least, that you cannot do business with a monster. We have to create something new. I would love to see a national youth orchestra which is truly representative of Great Britain, where you get into that orchestra on the basis of merit, not how much money your parents have and whether they can pay for the course. I'd like to see music colleges where gifted young people are able to get the very best. Teaching at a music college should not be just a career move for the professors. It should be because of your commitment to the future of music. Teaching at every other level should not just be an easy option. I mean, you know that there's this perception in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, that the less successful you are as a musician, the more likely you end up teaching in schools and at low levels. So if you're not a great musician and don't understand the instrument so well, how can you possibly teach the next generation musicians? I remember when I was at university in Cape Town, we did a module called Music Education. And in this module, one student spoke up to the professor the professor was Professor Millicent Rink, who was a world expert on music education. And he said to her, Dr. Rink, I've just realized, you know, something which I think is important. And she said, well, what is that? And he said that far from having the professors at university, you actually need the professors in the primary schools because that's where the most important learning takes place. And he's absolutely right. By the time you're at university, you can take care of yourself. You can read and write and you have a perspective already. Early on in life, developing perspective and a framework for the future is the most vital part of the human journey. So we have a big job on our hands. I mean, I'd like to see also our orchestras, professional orchestras, embrace the whole society rather than perpetuate these kind of bubbles of class. I don't know, we could analyse this thing a little further, but if you look at society at large, where do all our judges come from? The same schools, same universities. Every editor of any major publication, they've all been to the same universities. Any political editor from any major newspaper. Every position of power is occupied by that sliver of the elite who come from the same backgrounds. It's an echo chamber. And how does one break this? It's by turning our society into a true meritocracy. Equality of opportunity, and then the very best prosper. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to have to say this, but it is true. We have a prime minister who's not the person best qualified for the job of leading the nation. But he's arrived in that position because of an accident of birth. He was born into the political class, or the, the ruling elite, and he made his way through the narrowly defined pathway to, be, to end up there. If you look at his cabinet, and all the people that surround him, they're all from the same stock. And as a country, we can't prosper whilst it's just a club for a small handful. And it is that very problem that also besets music. Music should not become a club. Some of the great musicians, I don't know whether you're familiar with, for example, Kenneth Silito, the violinist who was leader of the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields for a number of years. I've just read his autobiography, but I worked obviously with Ken a lot, but I've just read his autobiography, and he was the son of a miner. And yet, that was no impediment to him becoming one of the great leaders of one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And this tells us something. Is there room for a Kenneth Salito in the world today? And I fear that maybe not. I know of a lot of musicians who have auditioned for positions in orchestra, for example, and they don't have great success, not because they're great musicians, but because other issues are raised which prevent. So if you look at the world at large, for example, what kind of people do organisations employ in Britain? Why are they so dysfunctional? Why is it that we have a bureaucracy that cannot, for example, order PPE equipment? They get it wrong. Why do you have a minister who tried to order boats without any knowledge of boats? I mean, you probably know these terrible scandals. It is because anybody in a position of power is going to make sure they recruit people that are far less capable than they. So we have to change the whole society in order to change music. Music cannot exist independently from the rest of society. If you, I mean, I don't know whether you've looked into this particularly deeply, but what qualifies one to become the chief executive of a recording company these days, you know, one of the big recording companies. What qualifies one to run a major concert venue or a opera company? In business, we have a class called the chief executive class. One day they can be running a potato factory, the next day they're running a car factory. And they know nothing about cars or potatoes, but apparently they're professional chief executives. And this is what's happened to us. 
there has been the total death of expertise. I would love to live in a world where people who make decisions about the future will be experts in the matter they're dealing with. And as an artist, it is also true to say that there are so many wonderful experts in music that are not being employed for that expertise, and they should be. That was my discussion with Leon Bosch. And if you've been affected by any of the issues in this podcast, then please do access the links below where you can get further help and advice. Meanwhile, stay safe and please do join me next week for another episode. Bye for now.